It had been 21 years since his first victory at Toulon. Over that time, countless battles, whether they be glorious victories or crippling defeats, were fought. In 1814, Napoleon, now an emperor for 10 years, was on a final campaign for France itself. Despite winning several brilliant victories, the coalition inevitably overwhelmed his crumbling empire. On April 11th, Napoleon reluctantly abdicated the throne as Emperor of the French. After reviewing the Imperial Guard one last time, he was sailed to the island of Elba along with a guard of 400 men. In his absence, Louis XVIII was placed on the throne by May, restoring the Bourbon dynasty. At first, the people of Paris were enthusiastic. The Sixth Coalition formed into the new Congress of Vienna, which dealt with the hard task of redrawing the map of Europe. France's borders were changed to those of January 1st, 1792, and the Allied nations bickered and argued over the balance of power. But over a few months, Napoleon grew tired of playing Emperor of Elba, and sought the opportunity to return to France. With the restoration of the Bourbons, the émigré, royalists in exile, set foot in France for the first time since the Revolution. Many noblemen were given appointments in the government and military, largely for their status rather than merit. The defeated French populace looked on as their new king and his followers restored the privileges of the nobility. This was especially evident in the military. Young royalists were favored for promotion over experienced soldiers of more humble backgrounds, and popular officers of the First Empire were demoted. Napoleon, ever so watchful, was aware of the seeds of discontent and planned to exploit it. On February 26, 1815, Napoleon announced to the people of Elba his departure. He and a thousand men, with artillery and carriage, finished boarding a small flotilla of six vessels by 8 p.m. and bid farewell. The British patrol tasked with guarding the island later returned from Florence, and the crew were baffled to find that the little corporal was nowhere to be found. On March 1st, Napoleon safely disembarked near Antibes. As he confirmed his presence, he immediately planned a march on Grenoble via the Alpine Mountains, avoiding the royalist districts of the south. He was determined to reclaim his place as emperor. Louis XVIII learned of Napoleon's return on March 5th, and as he learned, the rumors and news spread rapidly throughout the continent. Orders for Marshal MacDonald to concentrate with the Dukes of Berry and d'Orléans at Lyon were sent. Marshal Massena was positioned to attack from Marseille to take the ex-emperor's rear. The Bourbons were so keen on capturing Napoleon that another royal decree was issued. Any Frenchman could freely apprehend the former emperor if they wished. Napoleon countered by simply issuing proclamations to the people of his intentions to seize Grenoble and bring the army to his side. As his column approached the final passage, a single battalion of the 5th Line Regiment was dispatched from Grenoble to block Napoleon at La Fouée. Faced with the men he once commanded in battle, he said to them, Soldiers of the 5th, if there is a soldier among you who wishes to kill his emperor, he may do so. With cries of Vive l'Empereur, the regiment embraced him. More battalions joined along the way, and he finally entered Grenoble without firing a single shot. Not long after, Lyon fell as Marshal MacDonald and the Duc d'Orléans fled to Paris. The soldiers garrisoning France received the news and defected en masse. Marshal Ney, generally disliked by the Bourbons, 
were summoned in their hour of need. He assembled the remaining loyalist troops at Besançon, promising to bring Napoleon back, quote, in an iron cage. But at lons les saunier he would instead join him with his force of 6,000 men. Soon enough, Paris itself became a haven of revolutionary fervor. Louis XVIII promised to stay, but it was nothing more than a half-hearted effort to rally the royalists. In no time, he and the royal family fled to the Low Countries. Napoleon arrived the next day to thunderous applause from a euphoric people. However, he knew that his presence would not be tolerated by the Congress of Vienna, and began restructuring France's government and military at once. News of Napoleon's escape reached Vienna on March 7th. Information was sent to statesmen of all the sovereigns negotiating that evening. And by March 25th, the Seventh Coalition was formed under the Treaty of Chalmont. The Allies would raise several armies, expecting to field 700,000 men under the overall command of Field Marshal Schwarzenberg of Austria. However, it would take many months for the armies to mobilize and prepare. A 150,000 strong Prussian army under Field Marshal von Blücher began concentrating on the Lower Rhine. Simultaneously, the accomplished Field Marshal Arthur Wellesley, Duke of Wellington, found himself tasked with the formation of an Anglo-Dutch army in the Low Countries. Three Austrian, two Russian, two Spanish, one Sicilian, and one Portuguese army were to take part in the campaign when ready, as well as a contingent from Denmark. Most of these troops would not see combat due to the speed of events. Almost immediately, problems arose for the coalition. Most of Britain's experienced troops were still fighting in America during the War of 1812, so their numbers had to be reinforced with troops from Brunswick, Hanover, and Nassau in British pay. Blücher's Prussians stirred trouble, arguing that all of the Germans should fall under their command instead. But fortunately for Wellington, this was a vain effort. On the other hand, at first, the Dutch and Belgians were apprehensive about the prospect of a military campaign under foreign command in their own country. But this was eased when King William I of the Netherlands pronounced his oldest son William II, the Prince of Orange Nassau, as commander of the Dutch-Belgian forces. When Wellington arrived in Brussels on April 4th, his command was immediately opposed by the Prince of Orange. Furthermore, he found the British contingent in a wretched condition. The organization of the army into an effective fighting force was going to be Herculean, but Wellington would prove his administrative prowess. He assumed command of the British and Hanoverian contingents, transformed the peacetime soldiers into effective fighting men, secured trusted staff, and inspected the frontier units and fortifications. By the end of April, he already had a plan for the campaign dispatched to his senior officers. The Prussian army was composed of mainly conscripts and inexperienced soldiers, though it maintained its size from the previous war. Internal issues were not so numerous as the ones facing Wellington, but the existing dilemmas were major. For example, the Saxon contingent of the Prussian army had to be removed due to their bitter distaste for service alongside Prussians. As for cooperation between the two armies, the coalition states had a quiet distrust for one another, and were only willing enough to set aside their differences and resolve to defeat Napoleon. On May 3rd, the two army commanders met at Tourlemont to ensure that both armies acted in concert and to finalize strategy. Still, an air of uncertainty clouded the coalition that month as the armies gathered. Fortunately for Wellington, things would continue to take shape. King William finally approved of Wellington as commander-in-chief of the Netherlands armies, ensuring better cooperation between the states. The Allied army was then organized into three corps and a reserve. 
the Prince of Orange commanded the diverse 1st Corps of Netherlands, British, and Hanoverian infantry. Lieutenant General Roland Hill, a veteran of Toulon and the Peninsular War, commanded the 2nd Corps of British and Hanoverian infantry. The Anglo-Hanoverian cavalry and horse artillery were placed under the corps of Henry Paget, Earl of Uxbridge, also a veteran of not only the peninsula, but York's Flanders campaign. The Duke of Brunswick, son of the man of the same title killed at Jena in 1806, was appointed command of a corps of Brunswick and Nassau troops. Wellington himself commanded the reserve alongside his role as army commander. Altogether, Wellington possessed around 100,000 men and counting. As for the Prussians, the elderly yet aggressive Blücher organized his army as follows. First Corps under General Lieutenant von Zieten, a celebrated cavalry commander. Second Corps under George Dubislav von Pirch I. And Third Corps under the command of Johann Adolf von Thielmann. Finally, Fourth Corps fell under the command of Friedrich Wilhelm von Bülow, the victor of Grossbüren and Denewitz. All in all, the army of the Lower Rhine climbed to a total of over 150,000 men. As Napoleon unified France and reinstated his government, all attempts at negotiating with the Allies quickly failed. He looked to the scattered army, which numbered less than 60,000 men. To attain the numbers he needed, a total reorganization was necessary, as well as an effort to gain the people's support for war. Napoleon proceeded to finally abolish slavery, then reinstated freedom of worship and the right to petition. Understandably, it would not take long for public support to fall into his hands. As for the army, it was reorganized into five corps, four reserve cavalry corps, and the Imperial Guard. The new Army of the North was composed of the following. First Corps under the Comte d'Erlon. Second Corps under the Comte Ré. Third Corps under General Van Damme. Fourth Corps under Gérard. And Sixth Corps under the Comte of Lobau. The four Corps of Reserve Cavalry fell under the command of Marshal Grouchy. The Corps of Cavalry possessed some of the finest cavalry commanders of the French Army. Finally, the Imperial Guard would be led by Marshal Mortier, a veteran of the Revolutionary and Napoleonic Wars since 1792. The Grand Army's 60,000 personnel skyrocketed to 198,000 by the end of May 1815, with 66,000 more being trained and equipped in the depots across France. To accomplish such an impressive feat, Napoleon had to scrounge up men from the National Guard police, fortress garrisons, and other branches of civil service and defense. Still, such a number of men could not hope to match the 700,000 men being mobilized against France. Token forces would need to hold out the borders, while the bulk of the army campaigned along the Emperor in a main thrust into the Low Countries. On June 1st, Napoleon held final ceremonies on the Champ de Mai during which the civil code was restored and new eagles were presented to the army regiments. The coming weeks would see the final, bloody and dramatic clashes of the Napoleonic Wars.